I'm Pep Laya hosting Winter Games. I'm here with Jen Abel. Jen is making B2B founders successful in their sales and go-to-market strategies. And she's going to be discussing why founders need to first understand and collect insights on the target market prior to hiring marketing and sales bodies. Jen. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I, it, I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you brought that up as, you know, we, uh, so just a quick background. Um, we, we embed alongside founders to help them essentially validate, um, their commercial models in the U S market. And the number one thing we see from founders who are typically mostly engineering and product centric is how can I delegate sales as fast as possible, mm -hmm. to someone else. So I can spend my time on the engineering challenges we have with the product product challenges we have and really just put all of my effort into the things I feel most comfortable with. Uh, when it comes to the sales side, what we typically see is people run out to either hire a VP of sales or a junior salesperson. And what typically happens is, and this is our philosophy, if a founder cannot do it first cold, a non-founder will never be able to. And what we mean by that is the vision and the value coming from the founder is what is going to get um, an early adopter excited by working with an early stage startup, right? That social capital of making sure that the founder doesn't um, kind of uh, make sure that everything will happen versus um, you know, working with a sales, with an, a salesperson when you have limited to no kind of brand equity. So what we typically say is do not hire any sales bodies until you have some level of, of revenue, right? Which is of course a lagging indicator, which we'll go into and two to three early adopting customers. Because before that happens, if you bring on a salesperson too early, one, they're going to have no reference ability. Two, they're not going to have any idea how to do it. And three, you as the founder are going to have no idea how to navigate it as well. So keep so you it clean. You need to basically build a playbook that you exactly. can then teach your account executives or SDRs or whoever. Exactly. Who or have a, and... have a co-pilot, have a commercial co-pilot alongside you, but do not off, do not delegate this, do not hand this over and say, okay, um, initial first sales hire, this is your job to generate our first two to three logos. It is your job as the founder. Do not delegate it. Um, in fact, that's why most startups fail. And to my belief, don't get to product market fit because they're off delegating this to someone that has three years of sales experience under their belt or a VP of sales that wants to bring on and, and scale out a team. So if um, I'm a founder and I have a B2B SaaS company, then how would I go about figuring out whom to sell, which titles you know, and so on? Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I think it first comes down to what is the specific problem you are solving in the marketplace, right? And then the hypothesis becomes, who do we believe is facing that problem with a high sense of frequency or a high sense of intensity? Because frequency and intensity is what drives urgency, right? So, so many people try and cast a wide net, go out to market and say, I'm going to talk to CMOs. I'm going to talk to CHROs. I'm going to talk to so-and-so. Okay. Well, what's the problem that you are uniquely solving? And more importantly, who's going to be facing that pain point on, let's just call it on a daily basis, maybe a weekly basis, maybe an intense and a high intensity on a monthly basis. And that's how you should begin to start to navigate who you want to be speaking to. More importantly, when you're reaching out to these executives and these buyers, if you're reaching out with a problem statement, not a solution statement, here is a problem we are passionate about solving. Is this something that you are facing as well? If you can inspire someone through a problem statement, right? That's a pretty powerful indicator that this is someone that you're going to want to learn from and potentially, um, uh, and, and potentially build a partnership with, right? So it's, that's you cool. Yeah. How would you know that the problem that you're solving is, uh, you know, is actually a top of mind, top five, top 10 issue for them? How would yeah. you go about figuring that out? Uh, yeah. You know, because you can explain 
you know, a problem that you solve from multiple angles. Yep. So that's why we like to say, if you can inspire an executive cold, right? Not warm. If you can inspire someone cold regarding a problem statement, that is a leading indicator that you might be targeting the right person, right? And what we mean by that is, if, you know, if I reached out to you and I said, hey, would you be open to a chat? I'm deeply passionate about solving X. Right? And you respond, but you don't have no idea who I am. What's a, and you're going to give me 30 minutes of your time as an executive? That to me says a lot about um, the potential uh, implications you might be facing, right? So reaching out to people cold, and we always say uh, positive, you know, warm intros can lead to false positives in the beginning, right? Because someone taking an intro call on behalf of someone else doesn't do you any benefits in terms of validating the problem and the messaging. What you want to do is understand if you can inspire someone cold first. Do you, do you inspire someone cold through LinkedIn, cold email? Are you calling them? Uh, probably, I would stay away from calling, right? Especially because most people uh, with spam filtering and unless you have their cell phone and you can text them. Uh, I would say test LinkedIn and test uh, email messaging. For example, if you're trying to understand and reach out to HR executives, right? LinkedIn is probably a good place to reach them. We know that they're on there, especially even sales folks, right? LinkedIn is a great place to reach out to HR and sales folks. If you're reaching out to an executive that's maybe in engineering or product or things like that, I'd say email is probably a better bet. Or you could do both at the same time and see which one sticks by just looking at the data. What if your product is not in a, you know, solving a massive critical urgent problem? It's more in the nice to have a vitamin category, if you will, then, you know, you're pitching them cold, but it's not a massive urgent problem for them. Is that going to work? If you're going B2B, it's going to be tough, right? Because people are inspired to take action on a, on a pain, right? If you're targeting the enterprise or even in the mid-market, right? Process is everything to these organizations, Right, and technical maturity and being able to align and excite an internal colleague who maybe you need to use some of their budget from. When you're coming to the table with a vitamin, either I would really, really strongly suggest looking at repositioning yourself because no one's going to go through the either the switching costs or just the pain of retraining the team on how to do a process if it's just the nice to have. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, pain is what drives change. I mean, I take a vitamin on a daily basis. I probably do it once a week because I forget. Because um, I don't really, I don't feel the implications necessarily of having to take it every day. Uh, versus Tylenol, if I have a back pain, okay, I'm going to be looking at the clock every hour to say, okay, when can I take my next, um, my next dosage because this is this is getting to be unbearable and the implication is I'm not going to be able to take a call or do work um, in that dis, in, in that discomfort. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you shouldn't hire marketing bodies before mm. founder is able to uh, sell it and now in marketing I wouldn't be pitching people cold on LinkedIn then what's the what's the marketing validation? Yeah so it's really interesting. People try and deter when they're doing when they're building out their distribution model and their go to market. They say, "Okay, we have sales and we have marketing." And um, most people want to lead with marketing because they think that's what scales and they think that that's what's easiest and they can touch it more people. And it's a numbers game. That's actually wrong, right? You need to be spear fishing in the early days. You need to be really learning and going deep and narrow on a very specific target market that you want to build credibility around and um, convince, some, convince them that you can solve their problems. You can't convince someone with a broad statement. You can only convince someone with specifics. So what we say is, listen, don't spend too much time you know, trying to figure out marketing and trying to scale it because we still don't even know what the problem statement is that's going to excite this market. So if you're going out spending marketing dollars on a problem statement that's neither here nor there, that's a huge colossal waste of resources and time. More importantly, 
the harsh feedback and realities comes through sales discussions. If you market to the wrong person, you're not going to hear from them. If you're talking to someone in a, in a, in a one-on-one sales discussion, similar to this, right. Um, you're going to get that harsh reality and feedback. Like, Hey, this is not something that we're interested in. Hey, I'm not really interested in a second call. You're not going to get that from marketing. So sales is really where you should be spending your time on in the early days. Once you get that insight and that evidence, you can now then spend that money appropriately in marketing. So um, typically in, in um, you know, when doing say outbound sales, if your ACV is under 10 K, the math might not work out, but you would still use it to validate absolutely marketing, which pain you're solving, which uh, title or industry you're targeting, et cetera. You, you nailed it. And, and Paul Graham says it best do things manual at first, even if it's a high velocity, low, touch point sales, which is what we call more transactional sales of under the 10 K mark. You still need to get those first four or five paying customers confidently, then spend the money doing some marketing initiatives, whether Uh you're doing um, transactional led sales or education led sales, um, which is what I would call more complex versus more transactional. It still has got to be one-to-one. And then once you get that initial inertia, and referenceability and hey speak to so and so they they just started using this too now it makes sense to spend the money on marketing but beforehand boy there's also a lot of marketing waste and i think that's why conversions are so low in the early days especially on the marketing front because the messaging you're using might not even be relevant Mm -hmm. do you have a um, particular example to give here where they tried something learned tweaked and then got success So one of my favorite examples is Zoom, right? So Zoom is what I would call high velocity sales, low touch point, right? You can just sign up, get your thing done. Um, Zoom Zoom came to market. There's plenty of of, uh, video conferencing services. You had GoToMeeting, Google Hangouts. You had a bunch of them out here in the market before Zoom came around. So they weren't weren't market creating. They weren't... um, they weren't doing anything super special. In fact, I don't even know if the technology is even better. Let's just assume it is, okay? I'm not a, an engineer by trade. But what they did was they actually spoke one-on-one to users, right? And, and let people log into the interview through Zoom. And what they realized was the pain point they were solving for was that people spent 15 minutes trying to log into their, their video conferencing service, unmuting, muting. They didn't have the right device. Maybe the device was incompatible. Maybe they didn't even uh, have it downloaded on their computer. So 15 minutes of time was typically wasted just trying to get the right people involved um, on the call. What they did was they said, well, let's just make this a single URL link and let's let any device access it. That's where they spent their time. And that's where they spent most of their, their, their focus and their energy. They were the only ones that did that. Right. So they were solving a secondary pain point. The primary job to be done was how do I connect with someone video through video conferencing, which there was a lot of solutions out there. The secondary job to be done was how do I do it effectively as possible so that I'm not wasting any time? And I know my grandmother um, across the country is going to be able to access this, which I thought was brilliant. So they spent so much time on the secondary jobs to be done and marketing f- towards that versus Hey, here's a, another cool teleconferencing surface. A question in the audience is like, can you also do sales led validation, if that's the terminology, to, to validate a product concept? So you actually don't have anything. You're just trying to fit, you know, validate the yeah. problem. I love that. Whoever asked that, you are ahead of the curve. So many people spend so much time developing a product in a vacuum without talking to the market. What's you can still inspire someone to take a call based off of a problem led statement. You don't have to show them anything on the first call. In fact, there might be an opportunity for you to build alongside with them because this is something that they're, that they're facing as well. So I would say um, having an idea and testing that idea by just mentioning a problem statement out into the market could be a very interesting way to collect some leading indicators of, are you on the right track and where might you want to iterate before you invest all this time and money in the product? Mm. Another question in the audience is, what about using lifetime deals as a way to 
uh, validate. So I know there's AppSumo and other places, you know, you put a super discounted deal and see if people want it at a discounted price. What's mm. your take? My take is I hate discounting. Uh, my philosophy is, you know, if you're going to be delivering the value, um, if you're going to be delivering the value, you should be charging for that value. Um, discounting could be interesting in terms of just like maybe to save a deal, like in terms of someone wants to drop off and um, you want to keep them on for another year and maybe having them pay a third of the price or whatever. I, I don't have too much experience in discounting because most of my focus is so on the early stage side, but I would never say that someone's getting a discount. What you could say is, listen, I know you're taking a risk on me knowing that we're early. Um, what I like to do is make this as easy as possible for both of us to partner. Here's how we're going to structure pricing. As soon as you start to say, oh, I'm willing to give you a discount, you're already devaluing yourself, right? And, and people also take advantage of that as well. So I would say in the early days, try and stay away from the word discounting. What I would try and say is I want to help you de-risk this as much as possible. I think it lands a lot better and it gives you a lot more ammo um, once you prove the value to, to begin to increase pricing. So to summarize then, the founder needs to close the first deals and validate through sales to see what is the right problem to solve, how to communicate the particular problem. Um, am I getting this right? Yes, you're, you're getting this absolutely right. And so uh, there's, there's a question here from uh, Mohammed. So if I'm a lousy founder, at lousy, <laughs> lousy, hopefully not a lousy founder, lousy at sales, uh, yeah. timid, uh, whatever, can I bring in a sales co-founder? Is that a good idea? So uh, we like to call it a co-pilot. Um, you want to be careful about who you're bringing in as another founder because you want to make sure they're going to be adding the value that you, you've added throughout this whole process. What I would suggest is if there's someone in your network that you can trust and say, hey, would you help me join one or two of these calls? Will you help look at messaging? Try and just get someone who has some commercial experience to act as a co-pilot alongside you is probably the best bet and also most importantly, not going to cost you a ton of equity. Uh, so I would start there. Um, I don't necessarily think you need a commercial co-founder as long as, again, your job is to get those first few logos. If you need a commercial co-founder to do that, I think that's a bigger problem. Last question. So let's say I want to, you know, now start validating my concept. Yeah. And I have mm, questions. So maybe I should hit up product people, maybe, you know, CMOs at SaaS, you know, so I have various hypotheses. How many attempts before I call the hypothesis, you know, like this didn't work or this did work? So yeah. So it's a it's a good question, um, and a lot of it is, I think, once you start to hear the themes, right? Um, you want to build a mental model in the early days, right? You can you can have meaning exhaustion. You could spend a year trying to do this, right? But your goal is to build a mental model to say, okay, I now have the confidence and conviction to double down here and use X. So what I would say is once you start identifying themes across, maybe try and get 10 conversations, right? Try and inspire 10 executives, 10, 10, 10 buyers, um, get 10 conversations under your belt. Um, maybe even record them just to re-listen and play back to yourself. You're gonna start to pick up themes and that's why it's so critical to keep your questioning and your assumptions that you're looking to validate the same for each conversation. Because all of a sudden you're going to start to have these aha moments around conversation five or seven, um, which uh, which will give you the the intuition to know where you need to iterate, or even maybe if you need to have a few more conversations after that. Um, so if you thank keep you, Jen. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Yeah, no worries. So pleasure speaking with you. People can find you on Twitter, uh, yep. Jen Abel, uh, Jay Jellyfish is the company. Look her up. Uh, any follow up questions, direct to her. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, guys.